Hello, gang or crew or whatever we're going to be called today. We're continuing on our week three talking about common law theories. So if you guys have taken torts, these might be more familiar terms to you. So another common law theory is strict liability. So strict liability arises traditionally when someone is doing some sort of inherently risky activity. So if you are doing something where you're handling explosives, radioactive waste, um, certain chemicals, toxic chemicals, anything toxic, radioactive, you know, something that like, if you don't know what you're doing, you could really get hurt, right? So this, the, if you choose to engage in this risky activity and an injury or damage occurs, you are held what we call strictly liable so that you don't have to prove, the plaintiff does not have to prove that um, someone did not act with reasonable care. Uh, so just just by virtue of the fact that you are engaging in this activity, you, um, you can be held liable. So they're, they're talking about as an example in the book, they talk about, you know, somebody, a con, a com, a company has a contract, uh, with regard to nerve gas at a weapons planet, uh, plant. And, um, you know, they're very good. They're highly trained. They use great, the, you know, state of the art equipment, but you know, something happens the gas escapes and, um, it goes into the general populace. So we don't know what it is. Is it weather? Is it, um, you know, act of God, something like that. Um, even though ACME maybe did nothing wrong, they may impose liability just by virtue of the fact that it is engaging in this inherently dangerous activity. Okay, so that's strict liability. So it's easy for a plaintiff, easier for a plaintiff to recover under a strict liability theory because they don't have to prove fault or negligence. Um, So if you can do that, that's awesome for you as a plaintiff. Um, Next one, which I think we're all familiar with, anybody who has any kind of background in law or um, lawsuits or things like that is negligence. Everybody's heard the term negligence. So to bring a lawsuit for negligence, you have to prove a duty, a breach of duty, injury, and that the, you know, whatever the breach was caused that injury. Um, So basically it's the failure of someone to use reasonable care. Um, And sometimes, you know, uh, statutes might say if you do if you didn't follow all of say the EPA requirements that's negligence per se okay so it means like you don't have, as long as you prove that they didn't follow these guidelines they are negligent um and then defenses to negligence would be if i am a defendant something called contributory negligence so if the other party was also at fault there um so contributory negligence, actually, if the other party is at fault, it bars recovery. So if, you know, the defendant was also at fault, they can't recover. Um, comparative negligence, which is really the, the standard in most states, contributory negligence is kind of old news, but comparative negligence means that your recovery would be reduced by your percentage of fault. So if you're 10% at fault and the jury found that you've su- suffered thousand dollars in damage, then you would recover nine hundred dollars. You know, reduced by your fault. Um, so you know, so that's kind of again a lot of that is preempted by um, statute, and then it's tricky in environmental cases to actually prove causation. So. Um, you know, so if you're near some sort of landfill and your life, the example in the book is that your livestock gets sick and, um, well, can you prove that the, whatever the chemicals in the landfill are actually causing them to be sick? So, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a higher burn. And, and if you can just prove that someone is vi- violating an environmental statute, then you, you might be better off. 
Um, public trust doc- doctrine, you know, basically says it's, you know, this is, it's old. It predates all of our environmental laws and our environmental statutes that um, there's some resources in our world which are so valuable that every they have to be protected for everybody to use now and in the future. Um, and, you know, it was kind of like when we we're talking about the, the pigs, right, you know, making the rivers clean, um, but then even go back to our first couple of lectures where we're talking about, you know, the Sierra Club and the preservation of national lands, right? We're trying to preserve views, actual, like, beautiful natural resources and things like air and water, air and water, but, and wildlife, all of this stuff. Um, so this doctrine, you know, courts use that to uphold statutes that might infringe on, you know, your a private person's right to use that property, um, and somehow interfering with your use. So if I want to, you know, I don't know, burn leaves and that's causing everybody in the area, uh, to cough or, you know, somehow get sick, then, you know, the public trust, keeping the public trust of the air is, um, is considered. Um, so that's your public just trust doctrine. Um, fraud. So fraud would be if you are buying or selling a property and somehow you mislead, the, you're selling the property, you're, you're misleading someone about what you have done on that land, right? You know, is it, has there been a spill? Is there toxic, is there, is there stuff buried in there? Was it a landfill? All that stuff. So a fraud, you know, you're not, you're making a false statement for personal gain, for monetary gain. And then, so if you fraudulently tell someone that this is great land, you know, totally clean and it's not, um, so that could be a fraud. Now, like you guys have all, if anybody who has ever purchased property, things that you might think of is like the, the lead paint disclosure that everybody is required to sign, right? Okay. Is there lead paint? Is there not lead paint? Or you have no knowledge of lead paint, but if you think there's lead paint and you say there's no lead paint, you know, that's fraud right? Or same thing sometimes like radon is another thing when you're selling personal property. Um, have you, you know, do you have any radon problems or do you know of any radon problems? So that's if, you know, you lie or mold or whatever, you lie about what is present in the home before you sell it. So that's fraud. And you can, you know, if somebody finds that out later after they purchase it and then they find that you knew about it, you can be sued for damages there. Um, so, you know, a lot of states have requirements about these disclosures. Um, so here's it. Well, New Jersey has a new residential construction offsite conditions disclosure act. So, you know, we have those mandatory disclosures when you, when you're selling a property that if anyone has ever sold a home or a condo or whatever, you're, you're familiar with that. And if you haven't, you will see it when, when you do buy, um, property at some point. Okay. So those are like the, you know, the common law theories that kind of you were able to use before these environmental statutes. And then again, some, some of them are no longer viable because they are preempted by these federal statutes. So say for example, you have, um, the government is the one who is actually doing the polluting and um, you know, there's a, there's a military base or a munitions factory or something like that. And, um, you think the government is doing something in violation of either a common law theory of environmental wrong or under a statute, you know, can you sue the government? So, you know, the, the short answer is no, but sometimes. So there's a doctrine called sovereign immunity, which says that, you know, our government, so this is, you know, st- statutory, um, government cannot be sued. I say used, sorry, that's a typo there without consent. Um, so without consent means that it's kind of like statutorily provided. So in the federal tort claims act, it, um, allows suit 
steps for negligence and what you call ministerial duties. Like you said, you locked up, but you didn't lock up like that kind of stuff, but not for, we made the decision to do it this way. Right. So for somebody kind of just made a, a, a mistake, but didn't make an error in judgment. Um, so that's, that's under for federal tort claims. So really, technically, yeah, you can't sue them under specific, except under specific situations. And the um, individual states will have their versions of this, their own little state tort claims act. You know, what are the possible, what are the, under what circumstances can you sue a state entity uh, at all, either under a statute or under a common law theory? Um, so, you know, government as a polluter, again, it varies with what governmental entity you're talking about and the statute you're claiming violation of. So very recent, you guys see this, hear this on the radio, see this on the TV all the time. Camp Lejeune was a military base in North Carolina and, um, there was polluted water and, um, you know, they actually had to a lot of claims were denied or there was a limit on the amount that could be recovered. And now there's like a new statute and a lot were barred by statutes of limitation. And now there's like a new statute allowing for recovery, recovery. So that's actually, you know, the government giving consent for, for lawsuits and, um, recovery. So it's tougher. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a statutory section that you can, sue under, you know, then you're pretty good. So that's sovereign immunity and suing the government. Now, criminal prosecutions for um, environmental actions are, uh, usually happens by statute. So some, sta you know, clean air, clean water or whatever will say, well, if, if the action arises to a certain level, there can be criminal penalties from, you know, criminal fines to, to jail, actually. Um, so some statutes specifically provide for it. Um, under common law, you know, not so much. It's very rare because, you know, criminal violations, you need, they, they need to actually be violating a, a section of a criminal code. So it's really not a common law type situation. Um, so, you know, we have these private attorney general actions, these citizen suits that are allowed under certain environmental laws. So, um, companies kind of don't like being sued <laughs> under these environmental laws. So, uh, they have come up with a strategy, they call it SLAP, it's strategic lawsuit against public participation. So your corporation is using, you know, their big money to uh, disincentivize private citizens or citizens groups challenges to their plans. So they do things like, oh, sue them for defamation, um, protective orders, you know, all kinds of things to just, you know, just kind of slow them down and um, make them you know, make them back off, you know, abusive process, interfere, tortious interference with economic advantage, tortious interference with, with contracts, right? Which are kind of like nonsense claims, but still, if you're sued, you have to go through the process of, you know, hiring an attorney, answering the complaint, you know, moving to dismiss it and that, you know, the, the lawsuit will ultimately fail, but the person who is, you know, filing the suit has then wasted a lot of time and resource on that. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, a jerk move on the part of these corporations. So um, some, some states have actually um, addressed this and filed, uh, enacted some anti-slap laws, which the example in the textbook on page 68 is from California. So, you know, it's just, again something to consider if you're bringing a to citizen lawsuit that, you know, they're bigger fish and have more resources and you have to have kind of a strong backbone and maybe a little patience before your citizen suit may be able to survive, which is another reason why larger organizations like say Sierra club take these things on because they have more resources. Um, so you as a paralegal in environmental litigation have a lot of 
potential roles. One being there's a lot, a lot, a lot of information that comes in in environmental litigation. You know, property ownership, uh, use of different spots on the site. So just kind of docu document management and organization. What's coming in? Who does it come from? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen bait stamping or learned about that in your intro class where it's actually a stamp that comes up with sequential numbers. So then that piece of paper then for the length of that litigation is known as 00005. So that's kind of like kind of old school, low tech. Now we also have um, kind of e-discovery platforms that um, all the material that comes in, if it isn't already electronic, is scanned and given kind of like an electronic tag number. And these softwares allow you to, they, they, the scans become, they, call, they have this OCR technology, right? Um, something ocular, something recognition. Uh, what does it say? Optical character recognition. There you go. Um, and then, so it's recognized as words. So you can go in and search scanned materials, like searchable PDFs, uh, so that you can say, all right, I'm looking for anything that mentions, I don't know, shed B in, in this large factory site. Um, so you can search, search that. Um, so as a paralegal, you might be working with these document management systems and e-discovery platforms to manage the documents that you have and produce relevant, non-privileged information to the other parties. The other thing you might have to worry about is, okay, what is privileged? What, um, does, is the other party not entitled to because of either some, either attorney client work product or trade secret privilege. And if you are claiming privilege, you have to have like a privilege lodge log, um, and later, you know, explain why you're claiming the privilege. And again, those e-discovery platforms really allow you to manage that very, very well, even redaction. So if you're like, I'm going to produce this document, but like maybe black out the names of certain chemicals or something, the e-discovery platform will do that. You like, you say which words you want redacted. And then by the time that it's produced, those are just either whited out or blacked out or grayed out. Um, however, however you've instructed it to do. So really document management is huge. Discovery, e-discovery, which is this really how these larger litigations are um, managed these days working, contracting out computer forensics to seeing if there's, there's information that has been deleted from hard drives or emails. Um, yeah, some of these e-discovery platforms like Relativity and Disco are, um, some of the ways that you manage this information. Other, um, I don't think I have it in the, in the PowerPoint, but other stuff that, uh, paralegals will do is if you have depositions, right, you might be coordinating the deposition. You might um, be helping the attorney prepare, right? If you're ha you have documents the, that the attorney has documents that the witness wants to be able to refer to or a map of a site or something like that. So you might be getting all of that stuff ready for the deposition. And then once the deposition transcript comes in, you're the one who summarizes that and indexes it um, to help the attorney manage that material later. They also have, um, you know, just creating trial exhibits, either, either manually coming up with it or contracting out for things like reconstructions, right, or animations or slideshows or PowerPoints or all of that stuff. Um, you work with the attorney to facilitate that. Okay. Attorney's fees, um, usually, you know, in, in our system, you pay for your attorney fees, the other party pays for their attorney's fees. Now, sometimes that they call that fee shifting, um, can happen either if it's, if it's statutorily based like that, if you lose the prevailing party pays the other party 
attorney, other parties' attorneys' fees, um, or if they're the somehow the conduct of one party has been so egregious that the court kind of awards attorneys' fees kind of as a punishment. Um, but that's pretty extreme, and the and the courts don't like to do it, and they might even deny your motion just to avoid getting to the attorneys' fees issue. Um, and then as part of attorney's fees, right, paralegals have, might be billing and they're going to bill at a, um, lower rate. So for an attorney, they might want, they have a lot of work to do. They might want you to get stuff done, um, to take things off their plate, but then they can also bill. So it's not like, oh, if the paralegal does it, I can't recoup that money. Well, yes, they can because the you know the ethical rules say that they can bill for paralegal time, but at a lower rate. So it's it's a win win, right? The attorneys can get the more big picture stuff, and the attorneys can still be paid for that work. All right, so let's now we're going to take a break. We're on the um, next chapter. But what you're doing for your homework are some of these review questions. So since we're finished with chapter three, I would recommend you go going through and starting to answer those review questions while they're fresh in your mind. So, you know, some weeks I'll assign them. Some weeks I'll just recommend that you do them. It's, it's always a good idea to look at the review questions before you take the quiz. And for this one, we're doing... Um, one through 10 in chapter three, and then some other ones in the other chapter. So I would recommend before you move on to the next lecture that you address some of those review questions. And I'll chat with you in the next lecture.